You were able to see your grade, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I think I just forgot to save and close it. <laughs> kind of useless. Um, I want to take people through a couple of things here before I start. One is, of course, you are seeing where the video lectures are if you miss the class or if you want to check them. You're also seeing where the concept points and the lecture films are. Um, I want to remind you that. I also want to remind you that um, do post on the discussion forum. If you're not posting, it's important. And I want to talk to you a bit about making the film for the class, because partly because I'm doing Fanon in um, my Wednesday class, and I, and I wanted to show you one way of doing it, just in case people are I wonder if I would give myself to go back to something Ganan asked me um, in a class in the side of public. I give myself about six, seven hours to do the film. Um, you may not need that at all. If you're used to making films, you won't need that. But if you're not used to making them, and what I would start doing and what I want to show you. show you is when I go to make a film on a topic, um, I end up going and putting links. So each one of these are some, this is for uh, Fanon, which is not for this class, but we will be doing a film on Fanon, and I actually made this film for this class last year. So what I do is I pull stills, um, a number of stills, I don't know if I'm going to use them or not, but I pull them, I put them in there, you'll see you know, there's just, some are pictures of Fanon, some are pictures of Wretched of the Earth, for example. And then, oh my gosh. Sorry. Then what I do also, and I wanted to show you this. So what I'm doing is talking to people about, about the film. And I'm saying, start pulling some clips because you're going to need clips unless you're shooting it yourself, which is fine, or if you're mixing it. So st start pulling clips. The other thing to go to the Fanon, so this whole file is what went together to make the Fanon film. Um, I also used films from the Algerian Independ Independence War, from the Battle of, uh, it's a film about it, from the Battle of um, Algiers, and also from the war in um, Algeria documentary. I took some footage out of that in terms of clip grabs. So what I'm saying is you want to build a file which you're going to use for your film. Um, I want you to credit external sources if you're, if you're doing a clip grab out of an, a film, as I've done for the Fanon film. Um, and if you're shooting it, that's fine. That's, that's even better. But I would say you need to give yourself, if you haven't done a film before, you should probably watch how to put together a film either on iMovie Maker, Windows Movie Maker. There's tutorials on YouTube, for example, which are quite good. The iMovie one, the, the one for the most recent iMovie is really good. Um, and you want to look at that. Then you want to have a file where you can draw clips from. And then, or you want to have a file you can import from if you shot it on a device and bring it into the movie maker, and then you're going to want to edit it. And whatever the length of the film for this class is, and I believe it's one minute, but I'm going to check. For some of the classes, it's one minute, some are two minutes. You want to make sure you don't go more than like 15 seconds over. So I mean, there's, so I would say, I mean, may, I would say give yourself, after you've got the clips and stuff, and if you're not used to making films, Give yourself a good four hours after you've amassed all the material to do it. Does that make sense? Because it's not, it's not necessarily, once you're onto it and once you've got a, a system worked out where you, you know, you amass clips, etc., it's not difficult. But in the process of doing that, I wouldn't give myself an hour. You're just going to get really frustrated. It's a one minute, 60 seconds. It's 10%. Um, so just to recap there, 
amass clips in a file as I've done for Fanon. Some of the clips, if you're doing a found footage, some of the clips can be still, some can be um, from other films. Or if you're shooting it, you don't need to amass the clips, but have a file. Make sure you've got an account with either YouTube or Vimeo, somewhere you could upload the film to after it's been after it's been processed in iMovie or Windows Movie Maker. And then you're going to provide the link. So is there any question there that I'm not covering? It doesn't, it sounds like I'm covering it, but I'm not. I want to make sure everybody knows what they're doing, and I want to make sure everybody doesn't start two hours before they have to have it in. No, I'm talking about the film. Oh. <laughs> but also the paper. Don't start two hours before you have to have a good piece of advice. <laughs> yeah, I'm talking about the film because I want... So what I was showing people was I was showing, like, uh, one of the films that I'm using in the other class is for Fanon, and it's on Wretched of the Earth, and I can play a little bit of it there, but I was showing them how I amass clips on it. And it's going to be used in this class as well, because I actually made it for this class. But you'll see a number of these are still summer live. I put them together. So you can see uh, a film of clips that were on the Algerian War. Book covers, text, you can do sound. So are people clear? If you're not clear, please ask me questions. Because I don't want, I don't want you not to know and like to start doing it you know, just the evening before and not have the clips amassed or anything and not know what you're doing. Does that make sense? Anybody? We're all good on that? Okay, can I get a sense of people that have done films before? Okay, so is there anything, yeah, people in my class, <laughs> and other people, is there anything I should add there? Brian, you got anything to add to that? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. Owen, what do you got? Anything? Just that you're right. It took me like four hours to do it, and you have to do it, so. Okay. And was that after you had the clips amassed, or no? Or was that amassing the clips, too? No, And then doing it. Okay, so you would say anywhere between, like, give yourself at least four hours, and then don't go with the product. Of, you, the other thing is, don't go with the first film you make. Play it a couple of times. See what edits you need. Okay. What does it do? I'm sorry. Uh, it's it's like uh, what's it? Why? When do we have to have it? Well, it's on the not until the April fifth. Okay, so it was like soon. I was like, I like that sense of like Small. extreme worry. Um, no, you don't have to have it in until April. I think it's April 5th. It's a sliding deadline. But I wanted people to get thinking about it in terms of pulling clips together. You know, so you can do like searches on authors you're going to use or of what you're going to shoot. And it's due April 3 until 15. Yeah. Anything else I should add to that for anybody? No? Can I, you got anything on it? Because I know you asked me the other class, which made me start thinking about it. Because I think you are... And unless you're used to making films all the time, you've got a system worked out, which is fine if you do, you would probably need at least four to six hours. That's that. And, and also, um, do look at a tutorial how to do it, how to you know, use Windows Movie Maker, iMovie Maker. There's some really good ones on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, the sound and like, music is okay in the video? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, some of these have sound on them, but I've got it muted just because I'm lecturing. Some don't have sound. Um, you can mix it. I mean, you can also do something if you, depending on what you're doing, say you want to do a film on the oceanic feeling, because that's one of the things you're writing on. It could be all sound with just white leader, or like white, you know, or, you know, so there's a number of different things you can do. I just want to see how it relates to the paper, how creative it is, in the sense of like how it creative relates to that paper, and within the time limit of one minute and not going over more than 20 seconds. Sometimes, so if you have to cut your credits, that's fine. Just put your credits in the paper. But yeah, good question. Anybody else on that? Okay, we good? Any other questions before I start? On anything I might, it might seem clear to me, but it's like not clear. Okay, so let me start, so I, oh, let me pull up the film on site E. And you'll see, um, there's actually sound on here. There's actually, I mean, okay, so if we want to start that one off, I can put this sound on just so you can see that there's, there's sound used and sound not used at different points. Obviously, I'm not going to play 
Obviously, I'm not going to play. But when you cut, if you're putting in sound, external sound, or somebody speaking, make sure you get the full. You know, make sure you cut it so you don't cut them off. Having said that, we'll see if I cut this person off. <laughs> it's positive. Okay, and I'll just play the first part with the sound on. Sound out on now, is that the speech? It's possible the sound's not working on this system. Okay, you know what? I'm going to try it with, I'll try it without plugging it in. It won't be as loud, but, um, with sound and with not sound. I'm going to cut the sound there. Um, for people that haven't read Saeed before, has anybody not read Saeed before? Oh, interesting. Okay. So look, Saeed is, um, I would say, one of the most political thinkers in literary criticism, psychoanalytic criticism. Um, he was a founder of post-colonial studies. Uh, he's, Saeed died in, in 2003. Um, and there's some, if you listen to the film, you can see that there's actually expert, excerpts from some of his interviews. He died in 2003. He was professor of English history and comparative literature at Columbia. He's a very, very well-known public intellectual. His book, if you haven't looked at his book, Orientalism, I mean, Orientalism really shook up um, what it shook up his, the field of history, it shook up the field of politics, it shook up any um, analysis of colonialism. So his book, Oriental, Orientalism, politicizes Orientalism. Now, Orientalism is an art history term for Western depictions and the study of the Orient. And it really sets it up in terms of the West versus the rest of the people. As, as an us-them social contract, us representing the West. That's, but Saeed is obviously critiquing that. What he shows, and why it's so important for history, for politics, um, for literature, and you, I would probably say you can't go to a literature conference um, where someone is not, like Saeed is so influential that it's almost impossible to go to a conference where he's not being cited, for example. Uh, particularly literary studies, particularly any sort of radical literary studies, um, particularly um, conferences that are dealing with post-colonial theory, you're going to find Saeed and Gatry Spivak quoted. And that's Franz Fanon, because he talks about Fanon. That's obviously in Saeed. Saeed shows that the West created the cultural concept of the East. which according to Saeed allowed the Europeans to suppress the peoples of the Middle East, Indian subcontinent, Asia, and suppress the peoples of the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent, and Asia from expressing and representing themselves as discrete peoples and cultures. You know, you could also add to that what happened was their cultures were reappropriated and resignified, and resignified through a Western lens which Saeed terms Orientalism. Now, what Saeed does, and why I think he's so important for this course, and why his book on Freud is so important, is that he contemporizes both Freud and Fanon, and you'll see that when we read Fanon um, later on. Because what he does is put the 
you know, Fanon is obviously talking about the Algerian Revolution, and if you haven't read, um, I mean, you'll be reading Colonial Mental Disorders, which Fanon wrote as a psychiatrist working in Algeria during the Algerian Revolution. Um, but if you haven't read Wretched of the Earth, like put it on your reading list. It's like a brilliant, brilliant book. It's one of the, I'm lecturing on it this week actually in my other class, I'm lecturing on the chapters on violence. It's one of the definitive works on violence and the use of violence. And so what Said does is he really links um, the Palestinian-Israeli situation with the Algerian-French situation. We're not so much, although it's very important, we're more interested in what he does to Freud. I mean, obviously the most obvious similarity between Algeria and Palestine is the refusal to recognize the other's being. Which, what Said calls a negative sorry, what Said calls a negative hallucination of not seeing the existence of the other. So not recognizing the other's existence, recognizing the other's being, recognizing the other's being as an equal citizen is what Said calls a negative hallucination of not seeing the existence of another. And when we get to Chaudhara, who's also um, coming up, what she would say about it in terms of object relations is that it's the active denial of the existence of the other. Now, Said uses this very interesting term, which I want to make sure I spell right, so I can take it over here. It's a music term, so for anybody that reads music or writes music, contra, 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 he uses that term, and he uses it in a way, contra it's a musical term, it's a musical act, actually. He uses that to look at two cultures, to provide a plurality of vision, and I'll come back to it, I just want to put it up there first, where the new is always occurring in relation to the memory of the old environment, which fits very well with Fanon, when Fanon's talking about, you can't, I mean, we'll get to this when we, when we do Fanon, but Fanon is very explicit that you can't really produce a new human being um, using the Western model of humanism. So using a model of humanism that has built into an exploitation of the non-recognizable other by that model, can't be used to build a new one. So Fanon calls for, and, and Saeed's going to quote this, calls for you creating a new human being that breaks with the old culture. So what you'll have is some of the old culture in there, but it's going to break with it. So the contrapunta, which is um, a musical act, we're going to return to that, because Saeed's going to say how he uses it really specifically. He also uses the term when he's talking about Freud, he says Freud uses the term non-European two ways. Or there's two usages of it. And he's really politicizing. I mean, one of the reasons Saeed's, I think, so important is he holds the integrity of Freud's contribution because that's his, that's his way of reading text, is to hold the integrity of the contribution while also pointing out where it fails. So there's, there's two uses of the term of the non-European. The first use applies to Freud's own time. 1921, we'll say, when the last book he read on civilization and discontents, or 1999 to say 1937, um, 38. The second is after 1939. In Freud's own time, the first use of the non-European, Freud's awareness of other cultures is clearly shaped, and why this is so important is it's really hard for thinkers to break out of their own place in time. So Freud's awareness of his own culture obviously is shaped by his location inside the Judeo-Christian tradition, 
inside a particular type of Western humanism that Said's critiquing and that Fanon is critiquing, that Freud is living in a place and time where the idea of the other and problems of the other were not important. So if you go to page 13, because I want to stay also fairly close to Saeed's text here. If you go to the bottom of page 13 in the PDF that's online, he says, one is very struck by the fact that beyond the confines of Europe, Freud's awareness of other cultures, with perhaps the exception of Egypt, is inflected and indeed shaped by his education in the Judeo-Christian tradition, particularly the humanist and scientific assumptions that gave its particularly and peculiarly Western stamp. He's stuck in the Western stamp. He goes on to say, this is something that doesn't so much, and this is some 14, limit Freud in an interesting way. This is something that doesn't so much limit Freud in an uninteresting way as identify him as belonging to a place and time that were not tremendously bothered by what today in the current postmodern, post-structuralist, post-colonial discourse, he calls it jargon, but he's also referring to himself because he's postmodern, post-structuralist, post-colonial, we would call the problems of the other. So he says Freud was not really aware of this. And it's interesting because he continues to say, well, Freud's whole work is about the other. His whole work is about what is outside the limits of reason. That's the other. It's about the unconscious. It's about dreams. But to continue on page 14, it's always about an other that's recognizable to readers who are well acquainted with the classics of Greco-Roman and Hebrew antiquity. So when he goes to any sources, he always goes to Greek sources, Roman sources, and biblical sources. And one of the things when you're reading someone, it's, it's worth taking a look to see what sources they're using. Um, you'll find that you'll find that the same sources, you can kind of tell if the same sources that you find in a number of texts are reproduced, although they may be critically. But I've been on uh, dissertation defenses where um, one of the internal members was like, look at your sources, you're reproducing Western sources while arguing against them. Like, why aren't you using, why aren't you using sources that are not embedded in Western, in what Said would call the Western stamp. So it's a very good question. I think you need to take a look. So for example, um, when Freud refers to other cultures, he uses this very Western Eurocentric anthropology book uh, by James Fraser, which was, was standard fare when he's looking at India and China. And he takes what he considers primitive, the primitive, and you have to watch also, I'm sure you know this, but you have to also watch when texts are referring to something as a primitive. Okay? Because by and large, when they're referring to something as a primitive, what they're doing is taking what Saeed would call sort of, un, un, unless they're critiquing it, but they're taking uncritically Western colonial assumptions of what constitutes the primitive and they're carrying that right into their work. So as we all know, you know, it's ridiculous to call China or India primitive um, in relation to Europe because of course the culture is way older and has way more antiquity in terms of uh, both knowledge and artifacts and traditions, right? So, so in a sense, Said is saying, look, Freud fell right into that. He fell right absolutely into the assumption of his time. And yet, he's still valuable. He's going to get to that. But he's, it's very important to point, to point this out. Now, so that, that's the way the non-European, the second, the second way that the non-European emerges is, so 
So the non-European Freud is using basically to refer to Jews in Europe. <coughs> but he's saying they are European because he rejects that. And Saeed's very, very, he's, he's very careful to point out that Freud rejects one aspect of the knowledge he knows for a, a, probably a political reason. So after World War II, the post-war war meaning of non-European emerges after the fall of colonial empires, where you've got liberation struggles, liberated people, independent states in Africa, in Asia, and in Latin America. So if you take a look at page 17, he says that the second and by far most politically charged meaning of the non-European is the culture that emerged historically in the post-World War II period. And that's after the fall of the classic European empires, the emergence of many newly liberated peoples, etc. So there's these two meanings of non-European. Um, Freud is not using the second meaning. He's using the first meaning, which then Said is going to flesh out. But before he does that, he goes to Fanon. So on page 19, I want to draw your attention to something you're going to be reading in Fanon. And it's hard reading because it's so ridiculous. Okay? Not that Fanon is critiquing it, obviously. But Fanon on the quote that Said uses, and I'm not going to read the quote. I'll talk about the quote in the Fanon lecture. But Said produces the quote of the Western medical opinion of Algeria, the Algeria, the black Algerian brain structure being different than white Algerians. Okay? And Fanon is responding to this. And Fanon responds to it brilliantly. That's, so that's on page 19. I'm not going to read that. But what I want to use that for, so, you know, Said is, is quoting this taken, now, this racist quote is taken as given fact. Okay, so Said examines Fanon's examination of colonial mis mental disorders, and he cites the racist quote from this doctor called Perot, who is the leading scientific opinion that Fanon is critiquing. So you see the extension of European science into the practice of colonialism. What Said is using this for is over on page 21. And he's using it to say that Fanon's point, he's stressing Fanon's point, that Europe existed in the negation of the human. And that this very negation is inherent in humanism itself. So I'm going to read a quote from Fanon, which I'll read again when we do, when we do um, the Fanon reading, but what Fanon says, when I search for man in the technique and style of Europe, I see only a succession of negations of man and an avalanche of murders. Fanon rejects the European model entirely. Now Fanon, of course, has endured and gotten stronger since the time he wrote this. He, he rejects the European model entirely. He demands instead that all human beings collaborate together in the invention of new ways to create what he calls the new man whom Europe has been incapable of bringing to birth. So Fanon's is a critique of universalism. Freud's is a <coughs> universalism. Now what do you do, and, and Saeed's very, very concerned about what do you do when you've got a text that is embedded in universalism, a Western imperialist universalism, a universalism that somebody like Fanon is critiquing, a universalism that, that at that point had, had a science that was embedded in racism and was given as fact, what do you do with that? And he says, you know, he's not accusing Freud of that particular type of science. He's just 
giving, he's just kind of building the picture. Well, he says on page 23, and he admires Freud, obviously. He says, I always try to understand figures from the past whom I admire. Even as I point out how bound they were by the perspectives of their own cultural moment. How bound they were in their perspectives of their own cultural moment in as far as their views of other cultures and people were concerned. And he goes on to the bottom of 23. The special point I then try to make is that it's imperative to read them in as intrinsically worthwhile. Both for today's non-European and non-Western reader, who's happy to either dismiss them altogether as dehumanizing or insufficiently aware of the colonized people. And he's thinking of Achebe there. And I don't know, have, has anybody here read either Achebe or Conrad? Because if you read Conrad's Heart of Darkness, yeah? Okay, so Conrad's Heart of Darkness is pretty much um, now seen as a very European racist understanding of and I'm going to put Congo in, in brackets because that's the name that was given by the British, right? So that's taken as given. But what Saeed is saying is one must read Conrad. That one of the things that Conrad did was give rise to a whole bunch of writers in response to that. That Conrad's portrayal of Africa gave rise in the next generation to a whole bunch of responses, such as Anchebe. Um, Anchebe's got a great book, Things Fall Apart. Um, it's, an amaz it's amazing. So if you read Things Fall Apart, and it really is like the next, it's like, it's like the post-colonial response to Conrad's Heart of Darkness. What Saeed's saying is that one gives rise to the other. He says on page 25, and it's his approach, and it's a really, it's a really thoughtful approach to dealing with material that is very difficult. Okay, it's it's a very thoughtful approach. Um, I would say for dealing with material that when you read it, it somewhat makes you nauseous. All right, so you know. Um, Nietzsche is always a good example of this. And in my, in my um, modern political thought, Nietzsche is making someone that thus spoke Zarathustra is, is making people, I would say, angry because of some of the things he says, and rightfully so. And I think it's important to have that pointed out. And what Saeed is saying is, yes, this is hard reading. It's hard reading something where you've got, this is just crazy. Or when you read the dominant psychological opinion Western European psychological opinion of Algerian brain structure. You're like, this is just crazy. Like, how could anyone think that? And you get like really enraged. Um, now, you won't have this happen when you're reading Fanon, because Fanon obviously is, is part of the critique. But what Saeed is saying, for somebody like Freud, it's very important to read them. And what he does is he says, I'm always trying to understand figures from the past, past whom I admire, even as I point out how bound they were by the perspectives of their own cultural moment. He says, my approach is to try to see them in their context as accurately as possible. So you ask yourself, okay, you know, is this racist? Is this ethnocentric? Is this sexist? Is this, um, homophobic? And chances are you'll get yes to a number of those answers. Saeed says, my approach tries to see them in their context as accurately as possible. But then, and this is the bottom of 25. 
But then, because they're extraordinary writers and thinkers, whose work has enabled, and the key here is enabled, whose work has enabled others, whose work has produced alternative work and readings based on developments of which they could not have been aware. I see them contrapunctally. I see them contrapunctally. That is, as figures whose writing travels across temporal, this is on 24 going to 25. So you, as figures whose writing travels across temporal, cultural, ideological boundaries in unforeseen ways to emerge as part of a new ensemble along with later history and subsequent art. So what he's saying is he sees them, because they're extraordinary writers, take Karl Marx for example, because they're extraordinary writers and thinkers whose work has enabled others, has enabled alternative work, has enabled readings based on developments of which they could not have been, been aware. He says, I see them contrapunctally, that is, as figures whose writing travels across temporal, cultural, ideological boundaries in unforeseen ways to emerge as part of a new ensemble along with later history and subsequent art. Now, for any, I don't know if there's people in here who've got published work, but if there are people in here who've got published essays or, um, as in my case, a few books, one of the things that happens is your reader is not going to fully read it the way you wrote it, number one. Okay? The reader is going to put themselves into the text. And they're going to read it in the context of their time and place in history. Or they're going to read it strategically for what they want to do with it. Um, which is fine. I mean, that, that's the, the liberty of, of a reader. You know, one of my texts was, they wanted to use it, in, I mean, they used some of them in court case, but they wanted to use it in a court case completely against anything I was saying. So they wanted to use it, uh, what? They wanted to use it to charge, to, to add to the crown case of charging women working in, I think, SM in that particular case. And I can't remember if they did or not, but it was, de I think the defense contacted me <coughs> to prove that it was completely against what I was saying, because they were pulling parts out. I think that's what happened. That was quite a while ago. But one of the things when you're writing, I tend to use, I use people like Lacan, I use Nietzsche, I use Virilio. I use people that are somewhat objectionable and I read them against themselves. So I read them for my own purposes. And I was very, very much influenced the first time I read Said on this, which was quite a while ago, but by what he was saying, which is, you know, even if something's got many objectionable things in it, it can give, and they should be pointed out. I mean, Saeed's like, they should be pointed out, they need to be pointed out. But they can give rise to something that the original author was not anticipating. I use uh, Freud quite a bit as well. I also use um, Badu and Ranciere against themselves in a way for something else. So it, it basically, if you actually, it, and I would say that it really helps, this particular approach, and I, and I think Saeed was a genius in getting his students to do this. It really helps when you're reading material that you viscerally hate. You know, and I'm sure at this point in university you've read some material you viscerally hate. Um, and it allows you two things. One, to say, okay, what can I take away from this that I can use and make it work in a different context? <coughs> Excuse me. And secondly, what are the problems with it? What do I want to leave behind? You know, I use a lot of Heidegger. Um, and I use Heidegger very much in ways that Heidegger would like probably die. Um, and I think Said is, I think it's a very political move to, to try to see them in their context as accurately as possible, but then don't leave them there. Don't take it as the word, don't, but, You know, after you've recognized what they are in their context, how they've enabled others, how they've led to alternative work, 
work that couldn't be done otherwise, then see them as figures whose writing travels temporally, culturally, and ideologically, goes across these boundaries. So one of the reasons we start off with Freud here is to see how his work travels. To see how his work travels in, and is, is reformulated in different contexts. to see what unforeseen. Now, Freud would not have seen Said's writing. Um, he wouldn't have seen Fanon's writing. He probably wouldn't have seen Sagan's either. He definitely probably wouldn't have seen Chaudhary's. He wouldn't have seen Lacan's. So most of these have taken the starting point of Freud and gone from there and, and traveled with it. Writing permits this. Writing permits different actualization by a reader, who then becomes a writer. It gets further actualized, it gets further animated. There's latencies in a text that end up coming out. So there'll be gaps, so there'll be latencies in a text, but the author is dropped there un and doesn't know necessarily why, but then get picked up a couple of, a couple of writer generations later. So I think that's really important when reading anything. Um, I, think it's, I think it's really important when reading Freud, who Said is, is talking about, he says on 25, every writer, and I think you'll probably see that um, on the screen, every writer is a reader of his or her predecessors. But what I want to underline is that it's uh, that sorry, but what I want to underline is that the often surprising dynamics of human history can dramatize the latency in prior figure or form, but suddenly illuminates the present. So texts that are inherently of their own time stay there. We don't really necessarily know about them. The texts we know about have got something in them, Saeed would say, that takes them beyond their time. You can also, if you're Gatry Spivak, how many people have read Spivak here? Anyone? Marx, um, Marxist literary critic who really takes a look at texts that have never been read in the Western context. And, I mean, she also translated Derrida and Starwood. Um, Spivak is a ve very, very interesting, has been very interesting for many, many years. She's now um, setting up schools in um, sort of rural areas in India for kids to actually get an education that allows them, for kids that don't have schools basically, and, gets an and to get an education that allows them to conceptually understand so they can actually, and if you hear her talk about this, it's very interesting. I mean, so Spivak went from being, you know, a translator of Derrida to being one of the key figures along with Said in post-colonial studies to now really working on the ground in setting up education for areas of the world in India, because she's Indian, so she's looking at that continent, um, that don't have access to education. So, you know, if you take a look at, you know, Derrida gave rise to Spivak, for example. Freud, Marx, Heidegger, Hegel gave rise to Derrida. So it's very interesting to see what gives rise to and how that then changes. And texts that are inherently of their time stay there. And I'm trying to think of a text that never moved forward. I'm sure but that's the thing. When you start taking, when you start thinking of theoretical texts that never move forward, you know, you can't remember them because they really didn't move forward. Think, how many people have read Zizek here? Slobo Zizek? No? Okay, so Zizak, who really puts a spin and is always getting himself in trouble, mostly often for good reason, 
but really takes a spin on Western um, political thought and then moves it into something else and cultural criticism and social theory. So he's also influenced very much by Lacan, Freud, Hegel, Marx, who am I missing? Marx, uh, Heidegger. It's, it's the, it, they've, given, they've given rise to complete, completely different understandings, is what Said's trying to say. So texts that are of their own time, we don't really know about. I'm still trying to think of one. I was going to say, well, Strauss doesn't work, because Strauss really does. So, but those that brush up against historical constraints are the ones we keep with us generation after generation. Think of Shakespeare. You know, Shakespeare gets reinterpreted and reinterpreted again. A lot of, or if you see productions of Shakespeare, for example, it gets reinterpreted again and again according to the time period that you're in. Or if you happen to like to go to opera, like I do, so I'm seeing um, Wagner's Goddardammer on, on Friday night. Um, I've seen it before, obviously. The other thing is, I really enjoy opera, but I can never remember what the previous production after I've seen it after a while. I'm like, oh yeah, that sounds good, let's see it again. Um, but the thing, the thing is, what you really notice happening is that it, the same narrative isn't, and they always redo the same. I mean, opera's very interesting. A, it's extremely expensive, it's not supposed to be. But it's not for you guys, because actually, do you know this? If you're under 30, you can get like the same day tickets for like 15 bucks and probably have better seats than I've got, paying a lot more. So definitely, um, they, try to, they try to get a younger audience, um, because you've got to have subscribers later on, right? And it's a real opportunity, so basically you can get, they have special rates, I think you can even look ahead, they have special rates for people under 30, and you can get whatever seat, you can get really quite good seats, which is you know, kind of nice. So anyway, what, what I'm trying to say here is, the contrapunctually is also influenced by sort of musical drama, where, how it's staged, so when you read a program in an opera, it tells you how it's been staged before and how the stage is gonna be different, and sometimes it's staged contemporarily, sometimes it's you know, a mix of it. So you, get, you kind of get all of that happening, and Said is saying that's really what happens with texts. Texts that endure, that's what happens. Is everybody with me on that or no? Because okay. I, think, I, think I think he's making probably one of the most profound points in how to not, bet okay, in how to not betray, because I'm sure Saeed, being Palestinian, was very concerned about how not to betray himself in reading texts that he fundamentally disagreed with. You know? But it's really objectionable when you're reading. Um, and so he worked out this very ethical and political way of doing it. Freud Saeed says, page 27. Freud really lends himself especially, he lends himself especially to rereading in different contexts. It's the middle of the page, 27. He lends himself especially to rereading in different contexts because his work is all about how life history offers itself by recollection, research, reflection, to endless structuring and restructuring in both the individual and collective sense. So there's theorists, what Said is suggesting there, and I would add Marx to Freud. Can you just look up and see if that's taping okay? Okay, good, thanks. There's particular theorists, there's certain theorists that lend themselves to rereading in different contexts. Because their work is about how life history offers itself through rec his work. Recollection, research, reflection to endless structuring and restructuring in both individual and collective. I mean, if you take a look at somebody like Marx, Marx's work really is about how the dialectic that he takes out of Hegel works through history in different historical manifestations. So it's always vibrant. And then what you get are add to to Marx in terms of how classes understand, how class manifests, what the particular historical mode of production 
and the immunological configurations are at a particular time. You get you know, nuanced readings of Marxism, but he certainly endures the way Said says Freud endures. He continues, he says that we different readers from different cultural backgrounds should continue to do our readings of Freud. And we should continue to, to do this, that is to reread in different contexts. The we readers from different cultural backgrounds should continue to do this in our readings of Freud strikes me as nothing less than vindication of his work's power to instigate new thought. So his work, Said is saying, instigates new thought, and I would say that every text on this course, excluding the last text on um, an application of anxiety disorder is, is heavily the new thought that comes out of Freud. So his work has the power to instigate new thought as well as to illuminate situations that he would never have dreamed of. As I said, he would never have dreamed of Lacan. He would never have dreamed of Fanon. He would never have dreamed of Said. I think Freud would be very grateful to Said actually. Because one of the things as a writer you want is your work, your work to endure. Now, what then becomes interesting in Said's examination, or is Said's examination, of Freud's last work? Because this allows them to go back to the two different understandings of the non-European. That before World War II, that after World War II. Freud, of course, is stuck in the before World War II. What becomes interesting in the whole other, see, I would say there's two takeaway points from this, from this text. One is how to deal, how to deal with writing and theory you don't agree with, but you know is important. I think that I think that comes really fundamentally in the in this text, as almost as almost a, like a way of doing it in which you don't lose integrity, but you do not give an inch. And if you look at any of Said's work, he doesn't lose integrity, and he doesn't the integrity of the original work, and he doesn't give an inch into it, the aspects of it that are not correct. And they can also be not correct in the time they were written. It's not just that they're not correct historically later down. They can just be wrong. And Said will point that out. I mean, his whole study of Orientalism, he points that out. The second thing is this, how Freud understands the non-European other, the, and he really exposes something that no one has seen in Freud before. So he looks at Moses and monotheism. So monotheism, of course, is like one religion, right? So Judeo-Christian, Christian, I don't know, Judaism, any, any religion that has one God. So he looks at Moses and monotheism which I've looked at, it's not all that exciting a text. What's exciting is what Said does with it. And this is Freud's last work. Now, Said's written about it, other people have written about it, including Derrida. I didn't know this, actually, until I read Said. I didn't put it together. I mean, I knew it. As soon as he said it, I knew it. But, so Moses, the leader of the Jewish people, was raised Egyptian. I mean, we all know that from you know, Bible stories, etc., right? However, what that means is that the monotheism is actually derived from the Egyptian pharaoh. That's the argument Said's making. He's saying, look, it doesn't come from Moses. He was raised Egyptian. It comes from the Egyptian pharaoh. So what does this mean? Said goes through some of the scholarship on Moses and monotheism. And he makes a distinction between Herzl, who was the, the leadish, leader of the Jewish people in um, Europe at the time, and Zionism. And that distinction that, that Said points up is, is the distinction between a Jewish identity in a specific location, that's Herzl, 
and Freud and Universalism. So at the end of, of uh, Moses and Monotheism, Freud points out that at the end of Monotheism, what you get is anti-Semitism. Now, he's writing this 1930 something. Because he dies, he dies, Freud dies in 39, I think. So Jews are foreigners in Europe. They're in exile in Europe. They're different from their hosts. But Said points out that Freud is dismissive of Jews being foreigners. This is one of the, the key things that comes out of Moses and monotheism. Or actually, let me back up. This is one of the key things that Freud does that goes against the text Moses and monotheism. It'll be interesting in a second, because he's, so he's doing something very important with this. So Freud is dismissive of Jews being foreigners. He argues that in a country such as Germany, they've lived, some of them have lived there longer than the German people, arriving with the Romans. Although they are different ethnically from their hosts, they're not different, as he says, they're not an Asiatic race, which they are, okay? So Freud denies that they're an Asiatic race coming out of Egypt, and claims that they're remnants of a, Med of a Mediterranean people. And so he says, okay, if you read Moses and Monotheism, this conflicts with the biblical portrait Freud paints of Moses' Egypt, Moses's Egyptianist. So Freud goes against himself. He argues, he argues universally that although Jews are different, they've been there longer than some of the Germans. They are different, but they are remnants of a Mediterranean people. which conflicts with his writing in Moses on Monotheism, where he sees Moses as Egyptian, and the fact that Monotheism itself is derived from Egyptian culture. Said says, okay, there's two reasons for this conflict. Pre-World War II, the term non-European is kind of unmarked. By unmarked means it doesn't really, doesn't really have any meaning. It's not used, it doesn't, it's not used the way, it's, now it's a marked term. European and non-European are marked terms. They've got meanings that go with them. It's an unmarked term prior to World War II and it refers to people that come from outside Europe. And then Saeed says something very political on page 40. He says, about four lines down, he sets out that non-European is an um, unmarked term. He says, I'm very convinced that Freud was aware that simply saying of the Jews that they were remnants of Mediterranean civilization and therefore not really different is janglingly discordant with the show of force about Moses' Egyptian origins. So Said is saying, look, here's a contradiction. Here's a contradiction in a thinker's thought. In his last book, or one of his last books, Moses and Monotheism, you see, he's very clear that Moses and the development of Monotheism has Egyptian roots. When he's, so it's got a particularity, it's got Egyptian roots, when he's talking about non-European in the Western European context, 19, 1930s Europe, he's saying, no, you know, Jews are not foreigners, they were here before. He's making a universal argument. He's making a universal argument that he traces back to them being Mediterranean people. So you've got this contradiction, and Said says, look, you know, Freud's not stupid, right? He knows he's making a contradiction. Said, uh, 
Saeed's able to see that contradiction, point out that contradiction, and point out the problem with the contradiction and why Freud is doing it. He says, Freud's doing it basically, as we can guess, due to the rising anti-Semitism that, that Freud sees happening in Europe. That Freud is trying to shelter Jews inside the realm of the European as a universal humanity. So he's taking that category that somebody like Fanon is really critiquing, and he's attempting to locate the Jewish people inside that category as European. And he's doing it for a strategic reason. And you know, Saeed points out the strategic reason. He says, I'm convinced that Freud is aware that simply saying of the Jews that they were remnants of Mediterranean civilization and therefore not really different is in jangling disconcordant with his show of force about Moses' Egyptian origins. He's doing it for a political reason. You go to page 41, he says something very, something happens with the founding of, of the Jewish state in Palestine in 48. Something happens that we're all aware of. When Israel was established as a Jewish state in Palestine in 48, Palestine's diverse multiracial population became divided into European and non-European. It became divided into the binary that blew Europe apart. Only something switches. And for Saeed, it's a major problem, as, as for many of us. Something switches in that the Jewish exiles of Europe, who are non-European in Europe, end up occupying the category of European in Palestine in what Saeed terms a paradistic, that's parody, a paradistic reenactment of the murderous division in Europe, non-Jews becoming the foreigners. So if you go to page 41, if you go down to the second paragraph that he talks about in the years after 48, you get a new re-schematization of races and peoples, and which seemed like a para, para, paradistic reenactment of the divisions that had been so murderous before. Israel ends up being internationally adopted by the Atlantic West and the peoples that had lived there, the diverse population that had lived there before, many of whom were Palestinian or became Pal Palestinian other, because uh, everyone was Palestinian at that point, um, then become non-European. So, and then he's going to say this is completely wrong, given what Freud knows about Moses and monotheism. Yeah. Would you say that history is just repeating itself, and pretty much the Jews are doing exactly what's been done to them? Yeah, I think. I mean, I might say that, but Saeed's got a more sophisticated take. Okay. Like Saeed's going to say that. I mean, yeah, I, yeah, I could certainly say to that. I could say, yeah, sure. But Saeed's, but, but Saeed's take is going to be more sophisticated. Um, and it's really hard to notch it up to the level of Saeed, right? So that's why, let me go through Saeed and then I can come back to them. So he returns to the reading. And he says that he doubts very much that Freud thought, or Conrad thought, that they would have non-European readers or they would have Palestinian readers. He says, and this goes to your question, Saeed points out that Israeli legislation has eliminated the fact that Freud emphasizes in Moses and monotheism, it gets legislated out, right? And this fact that Freud emphasizes in Moses and monotheism, that Freud ends up dropping in 1930s in Europe is that Judaism's founder was a non-Jew. And you could probably say, okay, he's both Jew and non-Jew. But, but Saeed's saying his founder was a non-Jew. 
The Judaism belongs in the realm of Egyptian non-Jewish monotheism. So he's using Freud to make that argument, and he's saying that this gets dropped, obviously, by the Israeli government. What Saeed takes as being really political about Freud's work is his archaeology, what he calls his archaeology of Jewish identity. And the reason he finds it really political in, in Freud's Moses and Monotheism is because it didn't begin with itself, but it began with other identities. It began with Egyptian and Arab identities. And then that was taken into self. Now, to go back to your question, I think, I mean, I think Saeed answers that. Um, what he's trying to show is that if you have, he's trying to show that in Freud's work, particularly in Moses and Monotheism, you've got a monotheism that gets picked up and narrowly channeled into you know, Judaism that is actually given birth to by what then becomes considered an opposition. Okay, so I mean, Saeed's trying to show that the other, the non-European other, and he's really crediting Freud for recognizing that the non-European other is there in the European other all along. Um, although what he's saying about Freud and Moses and monotheism doesn't really relate to what we read in Freud, what relates to what we read in Freud is how Saeed's proposing to read texts that are tainted by a politics of the time and a politics of the author's belief. And then he's saying it's, it's, it's this contradiction, when you get to an author's contradiction, where on the one hand, the people that are talking, where on the one hand, if in one of their works they're saying actually monotheism was formed as a Egyptian, you know, tra can be traced out of the Egyptian pharaoh's teachings, um, and Freud documents that in Moses and Monotheism and documents quotes on that coming from, from uh, writings. And then completely denies it in a European context and says, no, you know, Jews are not non-European. Um, rather, they were you know, in Germany a long time, as long as Romans, they came with the Romans, etc. He goes through all this. And then quite correctly, as you point out, that same argument gets repeated now in the land of Palestine, um, you know, after 1948. So I mean, he's trying to point those three things out, I think. Um, and I think he's doing, um, I think he's doing an excellent job in trying to hold, you know, trying to hold his argument together and apply it. So then he looks at archaeology. He says, okay, what I really, you know, he says, what I really want to command Freud for is this archaeological work he does on identity. The identity of the Jewish people, which is located in Egyptian heritage or genealogy, you could say that. He looks at then the two types of archaeology that go on in Palestine and Israel. One is Israeli archaeology, where Said says that it really becomes a history of the negation of Arab pa Palestine. If you look at Palestinian archaeology, if you look at archaeology that, that happens, um, what you get then, I'm thinking of, of um, in the West Bank area, around Ramallah, around the digs that are going on there, what you get is an archaeology that is not monumental, not frozen and dead, but you rather get one that's based on village history and oral tradition. So one of the things, you know, people have done some amazing work on tracing where Arab villages used to be. And I mean, I filmed some of them for a project I was working on in, in terms of shifting borders and stuff. But what you can see then is what remains are some, some ruins, but, but you get um, cactuses. You get like, you get the whole grove, so you can actually see what's left of a living cactus, cacti that are like huge and you can see them growing, and what was once there was a village. So you've got a different sort of type of um, archeological understanding of, of the land, right? That are there based on village history that is, that is past oral tradition. 
Now, in terms of non-European, to go back to that category, we should just check the time. Yeah, we're doing fine. I think we have five presenters today, so I'll wrap this up by, can people put their hands up who are presenting? Because Alex, did Alex make it here or no? Did you have your hand up at the back? Okay, can I see your hands again? That would count five to me. And Alex can't make it, so she's gonna do another presentation. You do know that if you can't make a presentation, what happens is it goes towards the discussion form, it's counted there, and you get a new presentation. Right? And it's, I figure that's fair. And I'll count it a bit more as a discussion form, because it's more fleshed out than usually, so that, that way it's counted. So to go back then to non-European, Said says, Freud never discounted or played down the fact that Moses was non-European. <coughs> However, according to Freud, in terms of modern Judaism, pre-World War II Judaism, the Jews were thought to, of as European. Now, what are the reasons for this, Said says, is that Freud doesn't have an understanding of Europe as a colonizing power. He doesn't have the understanding, excuse me, of Europe as a colonizing power the way Fanon understands it, who was schooled in France. So he can see it up close. He takes this, Said takes this, he's gonna make a political argument now, he takes this into a, his European, non-European, the fact that Jews then replaced, became the European category and set others as a non-European category. He takes this into a binational state in which Israel and Palestine are parts rather than antagonists. So he's trying to use Freud, because this is his argument, he's trying to use Freud and he's trying to use um, Moses and monotheism to make the argument that Israel and Palestine are parts rather than antagonists and to make a binational state with equal, equal rights. He suggests that Freud's unresolved sense of identity supports this read. And that this unresolved identity with its origin in the other is more general in the non-European world than Freud suspected at the time he wrote it. Because Freud, of course, was really in colonizing Europe. He was located in colonizing Europe and he wasn't providing a critique of it. If you go to page 52, Said says something I think very important in terms of, of um, what Freud missed. He says, middle of page, it's actually uh, 53. Middle of page 53, in our age of vast population transfers of refugees, exiles, expatriates, and immigrants, it can be identified in the diasporic wandering, sorry, in the diasporic wandering, unresolved, cosmopolitan consciousness of someone who is both inside and outside their community this European, non-European self, other. It's a widespread phenomenon. So although Freud is applying it in the context of Jews in Europe, pre-World War II and as World War II is approaching, what Said is saying is precisely the, the dual identity with its origin in the other that then is being persecuted is way more, is, is way more pronounced than Freud could ever have had an idea. So you know, if you do any sort of DNA, if you do any DNA tests, I don't know if you guys have done do any DNA tests, um, you know, you find some interesting things out because, of course, you. I mean, it's not just the ones that are on TV, right? But if you have it traced back through your, you, know, you send in your saliva and they taste it back, right? They trace it back. Somebody bought my friend bought it for me for um, one of my birthdays. Well, I was very pleased to find out that as you trace my back and it breaks down, there's the usual, what you know, I kind of knew, right? But then there's some interesting stuff, like Bedouin. Um, so you get, you know, so you get a background that you're not aware of because, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, you get, uh, what was the other, Iraq? Like you get interesting, you get interesting links that you would not be aware of unless you had your DNA tested, right? So in that sense, and I thought of Saeed when I, I got this, um, you get, you kind of see that that what he's saying about Freud having no idea that very much what, what ends up being seen as the non-European other is also part of the self that's seeing them. 
And then so he goes through and he says, he says, the, this unresolved identity with its origin in the other is more general in the non-European world than Freud suspected at the time he wrote it. Now, you don't have the afterword here, but I'm going to read you a little bit or, or, or say a little bit about the afterword that's written by a, uh, Jacqueline Rose. She says, one of the reasons this is so, such an important text is because, of, of course, how Saeed informs about reading texts, but she says he's also offered Moses and monotheism as a political parable of our times a different reading than the way it was written. Said suggests that Freud's partial, fragmented, troubled, and at times self-denying relationship to his own Jewishness can provide a model for identity in the modern world. Then she goes on to look at how Said says we should read texts. She says, Said also, and, and most importantly perhaps, has offered the model of reading which he defends in the work on, on Joseph Conrad. And that is, and then she offers what she has taken from Said as a way of reading a text. You read a historic writer not for what they fail to see, not for the blind spots of their writings. That's too easy programmatic in critique, but for the, quote, as yet unlived, still shaping history, which their vision, which must mean including the limitations of that vision, partially, tentatively foresees and provokes. So you read them not for the blind spots and not for the missed. I would say you do that too. But you also read them for the yet unlived, still shaping history, which their vision, with its limitations, partially, tentatively foresees and provokes. Said gives the reader Freud, okay, Said gives the reader, that is us, a Freud in the present. In quote, a way that can only recall how Freud was and was not heard in, its own, in his own time. So for Said, the fault line. Now the fault line is an important concept because in a text, you can find a fault line often. Okay. The fault line, as we know from, from um, geography, is, is that which can break apart. Right? So, the fault line in Freud's text and the fault line in Freud's writing is that is what he says about the Jewish identity. For Said, the fault line in Freud's Jewish identity is that line between his grounding of Jewishness in a non-European, that is Egyptian past, and those moments where Freud attempts to establish the Europeanness of the Jewish people as, quote, not a foreign Asiatic race, but mostly consisting of the remnants of Mediterranean peoples and their culture. And then Saeed offers a suggestion for why Freud does this in the mid-30s in Europe. OK. So any, I'm just going to end there. I want to see how much time we have. About 5-2. Do you think if we stop right now, you can be back at 10 after, and we'll have enough time for 12 minutes for each person presenting? OK, let's stop there. So I want people back at 10 after.